worship in the Lord's house on this Lord's Day. It's a pleasure to be with you again this weekend. Pastor Lefebvre is with uh, the youth at the Winter Whiteout Weekend, hosted by Zion and Petoskey. Uh, and so pleased to be able to uh, fill in uh, for him this morning. Our order of service is the Order of Divine Service 3. We begin with the singing of our opening hymn. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord. And you forgave me of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and just to deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in this stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Deliver me from sinking in the mud. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. For your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading appointed for the third Sunday in Lent is from Exodus, the 20th chapter. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. 
This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Gospels according to St. John, the second chapter. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. 
and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. But I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, the life the world to come. Amen.
grace, cheer, and peace from the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come, even our suffering servant, Jesus Christ. Amen. That portion of God's holy word upon which we base our meditation on this third Sunday in Lent is our gospel reading from the second chapter of St. John's Gospel. You may be seated. Christ Jesus, dear fellow redeemed. The temple was a mess. Its holy confines had been violated. It was the feast of the Passover and the place of the centrality of the worship of God's people had been defined. And Jesus was not at all pleased about it. The temple destroyed. Jesus came to the temple at the very time of the Passover. He came to the place that the ancient Israelites, Jews, came to worship. He, no doubt, came as part of the Passover ritual in right observance himself. He'd come up to Jerusalem, and it was meet and right so for him to do. He was there fulfilling the law. But what he found was appalling. The temple courts were filled with unseemly activity. The place where worship and sacrifice should be carried out was filled with money changers. The temple was filled with people who were selling animals for sacrifice. The very sacrifices that should have been being offered by one bringing their own animal to make it a sacrifice, not purchasing something at the store on their way to the temple. Not only had the temple been violated, but the very ritual that was to transpire, the very purpose that the people were there to carry out had been set aside in favor of commerce. There was no sacrifice that was a proper sacrifice in the eyes of God that was going to take place in the temple that day. There would be no atonement based on the observance of those laws which weren't being observed. The glory had long departed from the temple, and Jesus was indignant. So he cleansed the temple. He cast out the money changers and their filthy lucre. He overturned the tables, poured out their coins, drove them out of his father's dwelling place, cast out the sellers of goods, and he demanded that things be set right such that the disciples remembered it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now the Jews weren't any happier about what Jesus had just done in the temple than Jesus was about what they were doing. How could this guy, this Jesus, do such a thing, they wondered. By what authority did he act? His sign came in the form of a word. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews didn't understand. Their minds went to the wrong place, and all they could do was babble some answer about the number of years that it had taken their forefathers to construct the edifice in which they stood. They were set apart from the truth and it caused them to reject the truth that was right before their very eyes. The temple indeed needed to be rebuilt. Our temples need destroying also. At creation, God created each of us in his own image, the imago dei, the image of God. He formed us out of the dust of the earth. He breathed into us the very breath of life such that we became living beings and he made us to be his living temples and dwelt among us. It wasn't long, though. It wasn't long before we destroyed the very temples that God had created for us and made them just as filthy as the temple was the day Jesus founded at Passover. 
in a moment. Adam and Eve brought into the temples of their bodies the filth of sin. They cast out the things of God. They brought in the things of Satan. And life was quickly replaced with death. And the temples, the temples of human bodies were destroyed. And each of us seated here in this place this morning is no different than they were. Conceived and born into the very sin inherited from our forefathers, Adam and Eve, our original sin, the temples of our bodies are filled with filth. In our actual sin, we bring in the filthy lucre and commerce of our transgressions. We do that which we are not to do, those sins of our commission. We don't do that which we are to do, those sins of our omission. We do not love the Lord our God with all our heart, body, mind, and soul. And we do not love our neighbors as ourselves. Honest with ourselves, we were unnerved and twitching during the reading of the Old Testament lesson and the recounting again of the Ten Commandments. We actively tear down our fleshly temples. In sin, we flee towards our own destruction. In our sin, we're blinded to the infestation that is mounted against us and within us. Yes, our temples are destroyed left for destruction and consummation on the final day. But Jesus' temple was destroyed too. Jesus exclaimed, destroy this temple. He wasn't speaking of the building in which he stood. He was speaking about himself. He was referring to the dwelling of God among his people. He was referring to the fact that the temple of his body would be destroyed. And destroyed it was. Bloodied and beaten. His skin slashed with whips and cats of nine tails. Flesh torn from its place. Turned over and beaten some more. A crown of thorns fashioned and pressed in to his head, forced to carry the own instrument of his execution, led through the streets of Jerusalem, hoisted upon the cross and nailed in place, nails in hands and feet and spear inside, ridiculed, executed. In time, the suffocation of crucifixion would come and he would breathe his last. He hung dead, the temple was destroyed. This agony, nothing, nothing about this agony compared to the destruction his father wrought upon said temple. The full wrath of God, the full weight of laws, condemnation, eternity in hell, bearing the great burden of the sin of the entire world all at the same time. He, God and man, hung dead. The temple destroyed by our sin. But Jesus' temple was rebuilt. He rebuilt his temple. He was good to his word. And three days hence, the very body that hung dead on the cross and had laid in the tomb was restored. The final breath of Friday afternoon was replaced by the first breath of the resurrection. Where death reigned, life had arisen. Jesus fully restored temple of his body still bore the scars and marks of his glory as he exited the tomb. God and man not dead but very much alive. Death couldn't contain him. He made good on his word. The temple of his body had been destroyed and yes, after three days he raised it up and it would never be destroyed again. So too then the temples of our bodies. Christ has buried them in his death. He has cleansed us with the balm of his forgiveness. He has drenched us with his holy word. And he has removed the stain of our sin and the guilt that went along with it. The death of our sin lay buried in a watery grave. He has restored to us the Imago Dei. 
that image of God within us. He has sent his Holy Spirit to dwell within our hearts, to take up residence once again in his temple. The hymn writer puts it this way, We are God's house of living stones, built for his own habitation. He, through baptismal grace, us owns heirs of his wondrous salvation. That is to say, the temple of our bodies are restored in forgiveness, in life, and in salvation. And they are restored in anticipation of the full restoration that shall be ours in eternity. The temple itself has been restored too. Jesus cleansed the earthly frame of the temple that Passover week in our text. He did cast out the money changers. He cast out those who engaged in commerce. He temporarily restored the temple court that very day. But on the day of his death, he did even more. The temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. No longer was access to God the Father blocked. The Holy of Holies laid open and bare to all the once and for all propitiation for sin had been made. The sacrifice of atonement was complete. Thus, the temple was no longer needed. The sacrifice was accomplished. The building was now, frankly, a relic. And in 70 AD, not that long after the events of our text, that building was destroyed by the Romans. And it's never been rebuilt. It is not needed because Christ has built the greater temple. In fact, it was that to which the temple in Jerusalem pointed. The mercy seat, no longer the place of God's dwelling among his people. No, for now God's people would dwell with him in his temple. His people would dwell with him in eternity. The temple isn't just rebuilt. The new Jerusalem shall descend in the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, with sin undone and creation fully restored. And Christ has done it all. Full restoration, which sin had destroyed, has been accomplished. The temple is cleansed. Jesus has suffered, he has died, he has risen. The temple destroyed was raised after three days. Thus, the temples of our bodies are cleansed too. For Christ has forgiven you all of your sin. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, you are a jealous God. Save the third and fourth generations that will come after us from your punishment. Fill us with your son's zeal for your house that we may cast every idol from our hearts and be devoted to you and your commandments. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, your Son's cross and crucifixion is folly to the world, but it is the source of repentance and forgiveness for all his elect. Preserve the preaching of the cross in our midst and around the world through our missionaries, the Malbergs, 
the Neuendorfs, and the Zabadis. In order that from this life-giving tree, we would continually receive your faith-preserving gifts. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord of the perfect law, you have called us to honor our parents and all other authorities, that it may may go well with us in our land. Bless Joseph and Gretchen and all who govern us. Make them wise in your ways that your justice may be upheld among us. Help us to serve and obey them in accord with your will. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our God, your steadfast love in Christ is good. Turn in your abundant mercy toward all who suffer in our midst, especially Cindy, Brian, Annette, Robert, Rachel, and Cecily. Do not let the flood sweep over them, nor the pit close its mouth on them. Deliver them and grant them healing, comfort, and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, our rock and redeemer, though we cannot even discern all our errors, declare us innocent in Christ of all hidden faults, and by your Holy Spirit keep us back from presumptuous sins. Lord, in your mercy, O Lord, you bless this day and make it holy with your word and the gifts of your altar. Grant that we may come before your presence to eat your son's body and blood, not boasting of ourselves, but of Christ alone. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our rock and redeemer, three days after the temple of your son's body was destroyed by wicked men, he raised it up again. Grant that on the last day, we and all the saints who now rest in your presence may share in the glory of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mine is the kingdom and the Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
I give thanks unto the Lord for his good. Let us pray. We give thanks to your almighty God that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us to the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.